Jeesh. And I'd also like to add some of the things that conversations that we're having, it's all in flux, you know, there's, I'm, I love being corrected on any of the facts that I tell these guys, of, you know, that it's not set in stone yet, so, um, but I, I so much look forward to Akak Yach Geti, Ken Kadunik, it's like my uncle, Jeesh. Can we uh, turn the back light on? This is my PowerPoint. <laughs> 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 my recordings. <laughs> you know, a lot of things that happen and, and, you know, throughout the years that I've listened to individuals speak about us and talk about us, you know, I try to grasp a hold of it and or wrap my mind around it. And I never really could. Now I thought there was something wrong. Which made me feel somewhat as like I was lesser than or was lesser intelligent. But as I grew older and continued to study and learn more about our people, that everybody else is thinking different than I was. And it's not nothing wrong with that. It's, I had a different paradigm of looking at life in a different way. And so I really enjoy reading Nora's recordings of our elders. It tells me how intelligent our people are were, are, still, and going to be. Because of all the things that we have uh, battled and all the things that we've overcome, and we're still standing here today. And I got two minutes. I give a thing of two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully, that if you do stay a little longer, I don't know how long. Yeah, yeah that's, that's okay. okay. I would appreciate that yeah. and be so thankful for it. Okay, can I There's so many avenues and so many ways that was spoken about that I I listened and then I, I could talk about that, I could address that, and there's so many things I and I couldn't keep record of all. But through this discussion there was one thing that I was reminded of by my elder brother, Horace Marx. I used to visit him up in uh, at St. Anne's Hospital when he was uh, living there. And I'd take him out to breakfast on the weekends and talk and sit and talk with him in his room. And sometimes we'd just sit, you know, which is okay. And then he'd just come out with something. I suppose he knew I wanted to learn something. In actuality, I just wanted to be, let him know that somebody cared for him. Somebody was thinking about him. So, he said, Paul. I said, yes. You know, our artwork really suffered. He says, okay. The reason it suffered so much is that our best artwork, our greatest artwork, was taken away from us, sent overseas or over in Russia or Germany or France or wherever. They were taken from us, so we have nothing to glean from. I heard reference to saying that the Northwest Coast art is diminishing. Not to our fault that our best artworks were taken from us. So repatriation in many aspects is very important to us. Not that we just get the item back, but something that we can glean from. Something that we can look at <clears throat> and develop that imagination of what was put on that art piece and why. I've listened to different art people who've studied our art, I can 
kind of follow along, but it just doesn't really click with me. I'm not a mess. I don't feel like I'm a really great artist or that I've been a great artist, but I've had my art pieces. I've started before I went to school. I think I had a little total fall about this big. <laughs> but I had a knife about this big. And I carved it. And my brother Johnny got a hold of it. I guess it was over at Jenny's house for quite a while. And he gave it to, uh, it's up in Bethel right now, and I think in a minister's home. And then I carved another totem pole. I'm, uh, I'm cautioning myself because um, I get conscientious when I start saying, I, I, me, you know. Mm -hmm. But I'm reminded also by our ancestors when we're in grieving about uh, uh, time for healing. We're grieving when we talk about these things because we miss it. We wish we had it. We wish they were still here. But I carved a total pole when I was in second grade and I, and I went down on the beach because I didn't want to use my dad's nice wood. And I found a driftwood. I sawed it off and I made them wings, but they were I didn't really sand it. And it was brown color from the weather. At the time, poles, yellow, yellows. But I took it to school and just wanted to show the teacher because it was our class. So I showed the teacher. What did she do with it? She bought it from me. I was going for that, you know. It's like a great I don't know how much do I charge. Well, my dad charged $1.75 for the, that size. He said, well, I've got a dollar seventy-five. So that was my first picture of uh, being an entrepreneur. <laughs> but you know, we're talking about the art form and the art style and where does it start. <clears throat> My father really didn't sit me down and say, this is how to carve. This is what you do, how you fix the wood, or whatever. He did it. He, made, he didn't say to make sure that I saw how it, I was there probably crawling around in his shavings while he was carving, watching, listening. But I started carving more, I think, when I was uh, 11 or 12. Started selling my work to Anna Cash. They were four-inch totem poles. And I sold them for, I think they started out at a dollar or 75 cents a piece. And, uh, weekend, I'd be carving all, all week. Maybe make five or ten, so I'd have money for the weekend. <clears throat> so, little did I realize this was something that, you know, a lot of kids couldn't make their money, even buy artwork at a young age as I was. I'm sharing this with you only because that it's still here. I learned from puts on my father, my brother, my old brother Horace, his totem pole of the strong man is up in Sea, Alaska. And I believe a lot of my father's large totem poles are in Seattle somewhere or Washington or throughout the state. He carved a lot of large poles. There's one big pole, I don't know how long it is. It looks like it was about 12, 15 feet long, and maybe so round. Didn't have, how did he move that big log to where he could carve it out of And then my dad wasn't that big of a man, but he was a powerful man, very strong. I remember my brothers, maybe Ed was in the boat too then, they were breaking arms and acting tough, you know. And my dad says, you guys think you're tough? But I'm, come on, put it on there. And then they, they swinging and he looked at him and says, is that all you got? Remember those days, So, but he was a strong man in many ways that I never really understood. 
uh, my sister Nora has said some things and brings life to my dad and become more aware of his being and who he was as a man. And he, he could do a lot of really collector type uh, types of artwork if he wanted to. But he wanted to protect us also because he knew or in his mind he knew that if he became famous, famous or whatever, would then mark the children would be treated a little differently. And so he did he protected us that way. My sister has a headpiece uh, of the Paysan Mountain, Paysan Chikiat. And so these these weren't just like art pieces like what they're at ooh, at ooh, ah, yeah. <coughs> and I'm, there's a writing in Nora's, one of Nora's books, Arts in Motion. Arts in Motion. They're alive. In our minds, they are alive. Yeah. Yeah, well. Our ancestors are in there. Not only that, our creator is in there. From that, we are comforted and we are given peace by it. We gain strength and peace from it. <clears throat> I have a, my dad's nephew, which makes Ronald Williams like my nephew. <clears throat> I come from a very old, older family. Many people don't realize, I think, sometimes exactly what that means. Because a man here, as the youngest brother of the Marx family, my grandfather was born in the 1800s. Probably just coming out of the clan houses, my grandpa. So when I talk to you, I'm talking very close to who we were or are as a people. The etiquette is still here. Etiquette I see many times in my sister Nora. And it's difficult for me to stand up in front of you when I have my. And Nathan is like my nephew, too. Because Austin Hammond was his uncle, but he was my great brother, <coughs> Austin Hammond. But I have difficulty in standing in front because they are my elders. And years ago, a young man or a young woman would <coughs> stand in front of an elder and speak before them. So thank you for allowing me to stand before you. And to try to share in, in um, impart some information that I, that I feel is important. <clears throat> and also there were, you know, there were, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong. <clears throat> The early settlers, the early people came to southeast Alaska, there were not large tool poles until we got the tools. Once we got tools, then they came up. They came back and they saw the large tool poles. You know, and it seemed like it's uh, an easy task, but our people were very knowledgeable of wood. They knew how to work the wood. And I'm sure today I could learn much from my Nathan of how to work the wood, how to read the wood, how to know what, hey, this is a good piece to carve right here. I better not let it go. He might tell me that. Or he might say, I wouldn't touch that. Ten foot pole. Jack, I got some sense to do for question culture. <laughs> so, our history is in, our, is in all of these items. 
There's a big story about Natukcha. Oh, and I feel comfortable now to bring it out because of what was shown on the screen. And we are balancing what we've seen. I believe, did Jenny do this one? Jenny Klanat did this. You look at, you know, I suppose I could talk about the form line and all of this stuff, you know. But what does it really mean? There's a rhyme and reason why things are put on there. It's not a, oh, I'm going to put this in filler. I think that's a good filler right there. Put this U form there. <laughs> you know what I mean? <clears throat> this Natukja represents of when a shaman went to go seek his power. The first time he tried, he didn't make it. I'm going to shorten this, this story a little. But then the second time, he purified himself. He washed his bunch of bath with, uh, with um, Devil's Club juice. I want to tell you why there's a reason why he did that. And then he drank some. But he also fasted for eight days. He went out in the, the it almost sounded like he was, boom he, boom, he was gone. But he was fogging the forest. You'd see, he had a bag, maybe it was an octopus bag, I don't know what kind of bag it was. You'd see something running. Gonna be mine. Stick it in the bag. Gonna be mine. Stick it in the bag. Gonna be mine. Put it in his bag. He did this to all the different animals running on the ground <clears throat> and the birds flying in the air. <clears throat> Towards the end of his quest, he came up to uh, Point Sherman. I forgot the name of that thing. Yeah, Point Sherman. Point Sherman. Yeah, what is it called? I'm not sure. I can't remember. I had it. Anyway, he ended up there. He was climbing up a, a cliff. And when he stuck his head up, there's a brown bear there. <coughs> crawled at him. As soon as he crawled at him, all that spirit went inside of him. The bear, too. Spirit. And he lost consciousness. But, you know what? There's a lot of other uh, things in that nature. But this is part of what... That's why... It looks like it doesn't, doesn't look like really anything, because there's so much in there. Mm -hmm. There's so much in there. Yeah. The faces, you see the faces, you see the eyes, the faces. Spirits. Yeah. Spirits. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. The spirit of it. A lot of you know, not just everything and the artists. New artists, they don't put a silica on my shoulders, nor our nose. Something wrong with that. But then when you put a spirit in it, it's different. It makes it look, it appears different. Um, another story here is uh, Natukcha. I mean the. Uh, <coughs> Kaku, Kafai, point, uh, Sakai point, blanket. Big story behind this. Austin used to say, "These are our deeds, like our deeds." Boris says, "You want to know our history? We wear our history." <coughs> so it's more not so of a. Art, it is an art form, but it means more to us than just developing or drawing something nice. It's a meaning. When I do my artwork, I, you know, for me, I, I look at it, and all my lines have to flow similar to each other. And when I look at the different things, like, like here, 
It's like <coughs> if you look at modern art, you just see an animal drawn, but you just see the surface of it. And I think to myself, when we see these things, it's like we see deeper into what that is, what's inside. It's like when we look at each other. We don't know what's inside of you until you speak. Like Austin would say, I'm open up my heart to you. What's in there when I talk to you? So that's what I see when I when I look at our art pieces. I alluded to uh, David Williams. Very good artist. My father's nephew. They seemed like brothers because they were both about the same age. So that's how the family is. His sister's son. That's David Williams, Willie Williams, Ron Williams, and uh, uh, Melvin, Melvin Williams family. Maybe Williams' is, uh, husband, David Williams. I mention his name only because that he was invited by the Queen to, this, to demonstrate his artwork. I share this not in bragging, but also but just to let people know or let you know, you never know that you're sitting next to greatness. Some of you are doing great things and we don't know sometimes. Some, my sister's been all over the world. I said, man, I think about her sometimes, man, she's a great people. I have a hard time leaving here to go to Huda. <laughs> Get off that plane. <laughs> but this has been our life, our people's life from the beginning. They've always wanted their life. We like what you're doing. Share it with us. We have so much to be proud of, to be not in a sense of arrogance, but in a sense of feeling good about who you are as a person. I want my nephew to come by me. Costin <clears throat> always said, I'm proud of him. I'm proud of him. He's a good man. He calls me up from time to time. And discuss things and makes me feel good that he thinks about me. Great artist. Done so much work, so many places we don't know. Uh, maybe we can, uh, if you can just stay with me, bring me some of your drums, Elijah, because I think we're running short on time. Yeah. And then I'll let Nathan, if he wants to say some things. Maybe we can take one. This is done by my sons. And that's done by my sons. This one here is called Ustukante. Here's the two rocks facing each other. And it's just, as it's told by Austin, it's like they're standing next, across from each other, but it looks like they're wearing a blanket. So this is their blanket. And then in here, to me, is the spirit of Chifkut. There. And you can notice his form line. You know, I look at Northwest Coast Native Art, I could never really develop that style. But I knew how my dad's style was. And I try to share with him, try to make your lines form or, you know, flow with each other. And don't make them, you know, don't make it too busy. Put something you can recognize in there. And this is one that they finished just recently, last couple of weeks ago, I think. So this one's uh, for your 
cow hit. This is for their house, cow hit. Then he has another one there that he done. And he, I told him the story about this just maybe once. <coughs> and then he drew it. Did he go to school for it? He watched Dad, I was carving totem poles and I was walking, doing these things, but he developed his style and at the beginning he was getting into the books. I says, the books are okay, but your grandpa, your uncle's style is truer to the style you can get. And so here, which one does this represent? Um, I did this one when I was first learning. I did it about two years ago. You can see the transition from each one. This one I did last year, and this one was just my most recent one. Paying <coughs> more attention to the art form. Thank you. Then, um, okay. Good luck here, okay. <coughs> Something that Lauder by Stone looked at you as a bead or a cheese, a group. I got this. <coughs> what do you think done that? Could you tell me what these are? These are just seaweed patterns that I've seen in a old beadwork in the museums and stuff. Mm -hmm. And even some of my grandma's beadwork too. See, so he knows that these are different colors of seaweed. I'm going to move it fast here because uh, I want my son to uh, if you could talk about some of the things on my grandma's work, or his grandma's work. My mom. This was done for me around celebration time. My son Paul put it to use. <laughs> this is the four season. The four season flowers. There's always a rhyme and reason. There's always a meaning why we got things. We can just throw it on that. <coughs> honoring environment, honoring life itself around us, seaweeds, mm. flowers, the birds, the raven, the ermine. Why do we use the white one? Why do we use ermine? It changes color so there's power in it. So we give this power. <coughs> The raven, we make him look nice and fancy and pretty for all the good things he's done for us. That's what Austin told me. <laughs> sea lion whiskers. And then there's some that have flicker, red, uh, woodpecker feathers. Honoring the birds, displaying them on us. We're proud of them. It wasn't just to put it on there. It was honoring those things that are around us, respecting those things around us. Through all our different things, and I'll close with this. That's what they put in the sheshuk, the rallies. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. You want to get, get the right sound? Get that dish out and dry it out and get those little rocks. Mm -hmm. Where a lot of people try beads, they try BBs, they try rocks, little rocks. The hooter. But there, you know, wasn't given pretty short time, I was just getting started. <laughs> <laughs> but I know you all, you're hungry, I'm hungry, and I also want to honor my nephew, because he's, he's, he's a great artist. He's done a lot of work, I've worked with him up in the area center when he was created the totem pole or the area center up there. Yes, Yadi, thank you so It's his good name. Uh, I just want to mention David Williams. It's the first one who went outside of Alaska when they invited him. And the Jewish England. And that an audience with the Queen. Oh. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah, my, uh, my bit of presentation isn't going to be very long from what I understand. It's only going to be the last thing about five minutes. <laughs> And what I want to talk about is uh, one of the things that people have a tendency of not really recognizing individuals, especially young people. And that is we have traits. We have that area and ability to be able to do artwork. And one of the things that I've decided to do as an artist is that any time that somebody has an interest in doing carving, one of the things that I decided <coughs> that the best thing to do is invest in a pencil, a paper, a uh, no, uh, sketch pad, and uh, a large eraser. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, I kind of feel that a person really won't end up cutting themselves, endangering themselves, or whatever. But I found through doing this type of thing, uh, one of the things that I was involved in was like jewelry. I think Nora has one of my pieces. Uh, I, I did jewelry. I like the idea. I used to, by the way, when, when uh, if you want to come up and see it, I'll, I'll give that an I'll give you an opportunity to do that. But um, when you <coughs> artwork, uh, when I got started in Wrangell Institute, I ended up doing bookends, and the the, the instructor was. Mr. Crawford, I can't remember his first name, uh, because that's what we call him by being respectful. Uh, Mr. Crawford, he was, a, he was an instructor. And he did, he did uh, little tiny totem poles of a bear for bookends. And then you had to pour lead in, hot lead in there to make it kind of weighty. <laughs> And I thought, man, this is crazy. <laughs> uh, and quite interestingly enough, when I was doing a poll up in Fairbanks for the University of Alaska Museum, uh, there was a lady, uh, uh, well, I, let me, let me, there was a fellow by the name of Jeff Lear who uh, was involved in linguistics and also spoke Clinket pretty well. And Mr. Jeff Lear invited me to a uh, university staff meeting. And, and so, well, it wasn't a meeting, it was actually supper. 
And I sat down, and there was a whole bunch of books all lined up on one side. And I sat down, and I looked. Oh, man. That's one of those ugly bookends. <laughs> and I was like about 12, I think it was about, I must have been about 12 years old or somewhere around there, right in there. And uh, I said, I said to the lady, I said, who owned it, I said, can I look at that, that, that those bookends? Say sure. And so I went up and I looked looked at it, and what? The, it had my name on it. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh man, I don't want anybody to see this. <laughs> you know? And I asked her how much. How much would you sell that? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I have, and she says, no. Nope. I says, okay. I just continued eating. And then the thing that happened was uh, when I when I went up there again, uh, there was there was a little thing that happened. I think she was really happy. I'm, I'm kind of wondering if maybe she got promoted. I don't know what the deal was, <coughs> and she said that those bookends that you've been asking about, maybe she went to the hospital and uh, she had cancer or something like that, and uh, she was free and clear. I don't know what the scoopy was, mm -hmm. but she was just so happy. She was really happy, and then, and then she says, well, you can come over and pick up those bookends, Francis. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> All right. Where do you stay? So I ended up picking it up. And then uh, there's another thing that happened. Um, <clears throat> my son, Stephen Paul Jackson. Uh, I mentioned that uh, he was. He had mentioned. We talked to him. What are you, Stephen? I'm half Tinker Indian, half half Caucasian. Uh, this fellow is a better carver than his father. And uh, one of the things that, that had happened from the start when he was 14, I said, Stephen, you can, I'll tell you what, you can either work for McDonald's or you can work for your dad. <laughs> he said, I want to work for you, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we started a project when he was 14 at Totem Bike, and he was, I was amazed. I was amazed at his workmanship. And what I earlier <clears throat> started with earlier was that that traits, them, them genes, you know, he has that from way back. My great, my mother's uncle, was in, in uh, Four Mile. He was a carver. He lived in Wrangell. His clunket name, would you stand up please? His clunket name is Kink. And he has that name, Kink. He was adopted by my uncle David Andrews. Kink, in translation, means higher than everybody else. And so then I look at my father. My father carved little before I when he was a kid. He carved little little tone poles with, that were lamps. They made lamps with a tone pole and a lamp. And so he had those things for sale. And uh, when Austin Hammond stayed at 
by where the federal building is. There was a house there that he lived in. And down underneath the house was his firewood. And it was yellow cedar. And so I ended up going down there, just, just carving away. <laughs> but uh, I didn't, I missed one part. There was a fellow by the name of Stayat, who was Jack David's stepson. And he carved beautiful bone <coughs> boards. And then after, many years afterwards, after I come out of the army, I spent a lot of time up there at the, uh, the building that was being worked on the, because the, the uh, museum was up there. And Mr. Kaiton was there. And, um, Jane Wallen was the secretary. And so I'd wander through, I'd look at all the stuff that I see, and I try to try to hold it in my mind. And then I go back, and because what you're doing is retaining from what you see. And so being an artist, in fact, when I started doing portraits, I started looking at people, looking at old Indians, and I looked and studied their face and studied the light that reflected from their face and tried to retain that in my mind and go home and, and do a kind of little funny sketch and then go to it and do a portrait and sell those for like, uh, I think maybe about $45 or $50 or $60 whatever, you know. But I quit doing that because uh, I was asked at one point to do a portrait of, a, of a, <coughs> someone's granddaughter. I won't mention any names, but uh, she gave me a black and white picture and I was really, I was really uh, having a little bit of a problem getting the coloration, you know, on that. But that's kind of uh, the trek, the places where I've walked, the things that I've done. There's nothing that I really care to brag about or talk about. After being done, I can be able to go back and look and see. Like, for instance, a bracelet, a pendant, a little something that somebody can be able to appreciate. And being an artist is someone who spends the time with sketch pad. And I think uh, I've even looked at uh, some of uh, your father's work. And I looked at everybody else's work I looked at Charlie Brown's work, and one of the things that happened here in, in Juneau is I was commissioned to do a piece of work in Ketchikan, and I thought, okay, I'll lay out a drawing, I did a drawing, put that in. And, uh, <coughs> hey, my five minutes is up. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, I did the, the drawing and I got this commission. And I was pretty happy about it. I ordered the lumber from Don Abels. <coughs> and my father worked with Don Abels. And uh, it was Blackstock Lumber Company in the Seattle area. And when it came up to Saxman, it was supposed to be vertical grain. There was a lot of pinhole knots in it. And I was having all kinds of problems. It wasn't, 
it wasn't uh, vertical grain, it was slash grain. And so I had all kinds of problems. In fact, I had my cousin come over. I, I need to have you come over. And, uh, because I laminated and glued it together, I, I put dolls in it and it just buckles like that. And she, I need to her to come over and step on it. And <laughs> bounce on it to break it. And then I went on to the lumber company in, in Ketchikan called Harry Bain Lumber Company. And I looked at all these boards that were all the way up to the ceiling there, but um, I would say probably some of them were about 20 feet. You know, they were all clear. No knots, nothing. And planed on one side, on the edges, where they would be joined together. And I said to myself, what am I doing in Juno? <laughs> and so I'm only ending that little story. Isn't that I don't care for Juno? <laughs> but because I had my starting place in Haiti. And I lived in Juno. I went over to Mark's Trail. I was with Aust not only Austin, but the whole family. I was connected in. I saw where Morris was carving. He was, he had the longer bladed knives for his carving because he had strong hands. He just, he just grabbed that knife. If he grabbed your hand, you can tell. <laughs> because he walked around with crutches, and he just held on to that thing pretty tight. And he was a strong man. My uh, great uncle Jack David told me, he said, when the days when they were pulling the net, he said he'd put his crutches right up against the boat, the end of the boat, and he'd just go. <laughs> just, just pull that net, and the waves would be coming over. He'd still be pulling. And so he was a strong man. And so with the respect of our uncles, with the respect that they have spent Time. I spent time with Jack David, and I, they were so strict, and I thought, man, I'd come home and chop wood, do all this other stuff, and I thought, ah, I can do this, and I can't even do my own homework. All the school work had to be done at school. I couldn't do any homework, but, you know, and, and I'd be really stuck. And I thought, well, I'm going to get out of here. And I did. I joined the Army, volunteered for my draft. I was spent two years in the Army and was, became a paratrooper. And uh, I maintained my... Uh, I was surprised. I maintained my rank. I became a corporal rating a spec four at at um, within about a year. I think that's enough bragging for me. <laughs> that's enough. But come, do come up, take a look. Thank you very much. We'll be back at 2 with more uh, wonderful presentations on art.